The GovX Show is supported by Forrester, helping government organisations perform at their best. Visit forrester.com to learn more. Hi there, welcome to another episode of the GovX Show. I'm Tim Coulthard, Community Director here at Government Transformation. Delighted to say that joining me today for a conversation is Susan Clues, who is the Chief Executive at ACAS. I'm sure you know the name, the work they do in conflict resolution, but there is a lot more to what they're doing to help public sector organisations in particular. Lots of work around education and how to improve work culture, leadership culture in organisations. Susan's going to reflect in this conversation on her own approach to leadership, how she's working with ACAS in the challenging environment of remote and hybrid working, how the organisation's preparing for the future, and how they can help other public sector agencies along that same route. Loads of information to get into, so let's jump into that conversation right now. So Susan, welcome to the GovX show. It's great to have you joining us today for a conversation. Hi, Tim. Nice to be with you. Delighted to have you. And it's um, we're going to talk a bit about a couple of things, I suppose. There's, there's ACAS's work itself and, and sort of what you're seeing and hearing in terms of how different organisations are processing through, working through some of the challenges that they've experienced, particularly in the pandemic, but also sort of in sort of modern ways of working. And then also your own take on ideas around leadership and how the modern leader can work with its teams and different people and, and so on to, to build a successful organisation. So really looking forward to jumping into some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, as ever, we like to sort of set the scene a little. So we'd be really interested just to hear a bit about your professional background um, up to this point, you know, your major areas of focus that have led you to this role today. Super. Well, thank you, Tim. And um, yeah, I mean, my, my career really has always been with organisations that have a strong purpose. So I really like to work somewhere where I can see the value of the organisations adding. And so the public service has always really appealed to me because of that. And I've spent probably the biggest chunk of my professional career at ACAS. And before that, I worked in the Department of Employment, no longer in existence. But that was all about kind of helping people into jobs, supporting people in periods of long term unemployment, that kind of thing. And that's helped to kind of uh, encourage me to work for ACAS. And ACAS is just kind of such an interesting organisation, and I'm really proud of it as an organisation too. And I think that helps me as a leader have that confidence and authenticity to kind of focus on leadership and those other areas of work that are important to me. Yeah, and I know we're, we're delighted that you're going to be able to join us later later in the year for the Government People Show. And I think there's there's multiple aspects of people in terms of how the public sector workforces are built how they're working and so on and I think maybe we'll, we'll jump into some of those so in terms of that leadership piece you as you say you, you sort of going through the organization you've, you've always had that that sort of mission around working in the public sector so how has that sort of influenced your your thoughts on leadership what what kind of leader are you what are those key qualities that you think you know leaders should aspire to in order to be effective oh goodness well that's a big a big <coughs> That's a big question, isn't it? I guess for me, it's around sort of recognising, first of all, that our leadership roles are significant. And I, I feel quite strongly it's a privilege, really, to be in a leadership role because you've got this massive opportunity to help shape your organisation. And so for me, I, I like to talk about kind of that you're there as a leader. And obviously that's around things like, you know, creating a vision in your organisation. But it's also as much about the culture and the values of the organisation. And we have to really kind of safeguard and shape those to be as good as they can be. Um, I'm attracted by the idea of the sort of servant leadership model in a way, in that I think that very much focuses on, you know, creating a vision and then giving a space to your people to support that mission. And it's about in particular, and I think the pandemic has taught us this even more, having compassion, empathy, 
an authenticity to really engage with your people um, and finding time for me in particular one of the challenges is that trying to find time to engage with colleagues so I love the idea of employee engagement and listening to your people it's a challenge isn't it with a busy diary to do that but I try and spend as much time as I can sort of listening and kind of hearing the mood of people in the organisation and then using that insight to help create a stronger future. Uh, because none of us as leaders have all the answers. Um, and, you know, people who do, for, in ACAS, for example, that frontline operational role, they know that better than I do. So, you know, listening and learning and taking their insight is really important to me as well. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of ACAS as an organisation itself, I think, you know, it, we might traditionally have seen it in the in the headlines when when issues have risen to a certain level but clearly there's much more to to the organization's work than that so for people who maybe as aren't, aren't as familiar with what ACAS does you know on a day-to-day -day basis you know behind those headlines tell us a bit about the organization what kind of organization is it and then I guess how that then how your leadership is affected by that and then I guess how your leadership affects the organization as well. Yeah, now ACAS, we're the public body that's charged with improving workplace standards and workplace relationships. And that's that's quite a responsibility. And we have, if you like, kind of a couple of areas of focus, both resolving disputes and helping to prevent disputes in the first place. And I'll just say a little bit about both of those aspects of our work. Um, so resolving disputes, that's probably the area ACAS is most known for. Mm -hmm. And they're disputes at work between individuals Individuals or groups of individuals and their employer um, between employers and trade unions and they can result in either legal action or strikes industrial action of other sorts and you know obviously over the years the, there have been changes in the level of conflict across the country um, but just to give you a a kind of idea of the scale of this work. Last year, we dealt with around 115,000 cases where there was a individual dispute with a legal <clears throat> context and around 500 collective disputes. And it's one of our ambitions as an organization to be able to resolve those disputes as soon as we can do and to have even more impact in that space. Then the other part of our our job is very much around um, providing advice, information and business support to help businesses avoid getting into conflict in the first place and to give people information um, about their, their, their work situation too. So here I'm talking about things like we've got a website that has advice, templates and so on. And we undertake research, we provide training and we also try and influence the world of work for the future mm. so that we can help shape workplaces to be more effective and reduce conflict. So that's kind of who we are and what we do. I suppose our, our mission, you know, why we're really here is quite simply about making working life better for everyone in Britain. Um, and that's about having, you know, workplaces where there's a strong level of trust really good communication between staff and workers um, that helps inform better business decisions and helps organizations grow and learn you know have greater diverse workforces so it's not just about kind of making everybody happy at work it is about the business bottom line being better as well yeah and i can see how that that sort of educational support piece the success of that means then that, that that first part, which is the conflict resolution, is less necessary and, you know, doesn't reach such sort of acute levels and, and you're sort of in a way designing out that part of the business. To, if you could, I, clearly people are people, so there's always going to be some sort of element of that. What's... I, What's going on in the in the world of work then? Because I think you know we've all, to, to varying degrees, been in sort of bubbles of you know working from home or you know in and out of the office, hybrid working, whatever it might be. Um, are there sort of common trends and challenges that you're seeing again or increasingly or what, what, what's the picture out there? Because obviously for most people, they're, they're, their own workplaces, their limited experience and don't get that sort of macro view of, of understanding, well, is this normal? So is there, is there a sort of what's going on out there picture that you could outline for us? I think one of one of the really big messages I think I'd say is that there's no one picture. So, you know, there's been massive disparity across the pandemic. So we've had organisations, you know, like mine in a way, we've been able to carry on doing what we've done 
our normal services all through the pandemic. We've had to do them in different ways, but we've been working. We obviously know lots of people have been furloughed for months and months and months. We've had organisations where they've really struggled because their customer base has changed. So I think that economically and um, practically, the pandemics, you know, had such different impact on every organisation, really. Um, there's no one norm. What, what I think we are seeing, though, is we're learning some really clear lessons about what helps organisations adapt in times of change. And I think in particular, we're seeing organisations that have coped well in the pandemic have been ones where they've been really clear on their mission and they've kind of stuck to that, but they've been flexible in how they do it. Um, and we're seeing organisations in particular where they've had, and uh, you know, this is one of my favourite words at the moment, compassion you know, which is about listening to their people, understanding the massive impact of COVID on not only working life, but at the same time, people are juggling, you know, homeschooling or, you know, relatives who are poorly and so on. And I think businesses that understand that and kind of accept that people are under pressure and therefore be as accommodating as they can be and supportive are the ones that have adapted best through the pandemic now clearly it depends on the sector you're in and, and that has a massive impact too but all things being equal I would say the quality of leadership um, the ability to harness your people to get uh, you know change and decisions made quickly has been really significant. Also working with trade unions, you know, ACAS has a lot of com contact with trade unions and organisations have often uh, really benefited from having the input of their unions to changing working practices as well at short notice. So I think it's that kind of team effort, really. Um, the pandemic taught us that there was no right and wrong anymore about how things are done. So it was about kind of adapting quickly um, and getting as many ideas as you could do um, and empowering staff. I think that's the other thing we noticed internally in the organisation. You had to strip out some of our traditional governance that maybe slowed down decision making mm. to speed up um, decisions and to empower team leaders to run the business and actually that's been a successful thing that I want to build on going forward as well let's not return to all the ways we used to work post the pandemic too. That's interesting and we've heard that from from conversations with with leaders from lots of particularly public sector organizations where in a sense that the, 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 the choice of how to be a leader was partly taken out of their hands some of the range of options was was off the table because you weren't in the same room as people so essentially trust was absolutely necessary because you weren't physically in the same environment as somebody but then they're now grappling with this challenge of well what what do we go back to what do we keep from this new way of working what do we want to bring back that was you know central to our culture or our ways of working whether that's that kind of collaborative spirit or what have you um and different organizations alluding to your point earlier about no one single picture they're all at different levels of maturity and sort of mapping out what the future might be like you know lots of councils are getting rid of real estate because they don't envisage ever needing that kind of you know headcount and desk space in the same building so for, for ACAS what's your sense of how you'll work in the future is it a hybrid model or, or what do you what do you feel like that the, the future will be I suppose some of the big changes for us, definitely hybrid working. So we've committed to that. Um, that might look different for different groups of staff. So we're, we're empowering individual teams to work through what that looks like for them. So if you work on one of our helplines, it might be different than if you're a trainer who you know goes out to businesses uh, for some of their week delivering training courses, for example. Um, but underpinning that, we've got some really clear principles which talk about, you know, we want our business outcomes to be strong. We want teams to collaborate still. We still want people to be connected and part of that wider team. I think the big risk with um, hybrid working is that you kind of forget people when they're at home mm. and that has dangers in, in all sorts of ways. So hybrid working is, is definitely here to stay for us. Um, I think the other thing is around digital delivery and online service provision. So we had a pre-existing website that was well used, but that's been increasingly used by customers during the pandemic. And we're particularly focusing on how that can be really effective 
uh, going forward and, and how to keep updating it as well. You know, in the pandemic, we saw the regulations and practical arrangements for workplaces changing often on a day to day basis. And we had to write guidance on things like, you know, furlough, vaccination, laws going to change again on vaccination for, say, the health sector. So to keep iterating guidance. So it was really up to date and having processes that could work. Uh, real time, you know, sometimes even overnight from the government announcement to having um, good, accurate guidance on our website the next morning. So really quick systems focus on digital. And one of the challenges for us has been um, working through how you get digital to work really well for you when you're an organisation that deals with people and those people delivered Problem. So, you know, if you can imagine a situation where there's a potential strike looming, you've got groups of trade union reps, you've got employer based reps, you know, possibly 20 people who traditionally we would have had in a room together, we'd have split them up into different rooms, corridor conversations, and you'd be able in the room, you know, to read the mood music, to sense the tensions and so on. And all of a sudden, we took all of those tools away from our operators and said, please, can we carry on settling those disputes but you've got a computer screen and that's that's your tool all of a sudden and I think you know it, it took her not very long a few days for us to kind of take a deep breath and say okay we still need to deliver the service how are we going to do it to best effect and to work through you know what's the best IT platform how do you best manage um, those different situations where you can't see everybody. Um, what about customers who don't have good quality kits, join Zoom calls or Teams calls? So it's taken a lot of working through, but we, we've decided now that for the future, actually, we've done a really good job at still settling pretty much as many disputes online as we did when we were in the room together, which is quite remarkable. So some of those we will carry on doing online and it enables us to get parties together quicker often rather than all travel to a, a common venue perhaps. So things mm. like that, that's another area we're looking at um, in particular. So digital hybrid working um, and I would say quicker decision making as well and empowering our line managers. They're really important things. And then I suppose the other biggest one for me, and, and I've talked about this with other companies too, and that's our focus on staff support and mental health. Yeah. Now, I'd like to think that we were bothered about mental health before the pandemic, but I think it's it's just come centre stage even more um, in a way that for the long term, I think can be really positive. Yeah, and uh, I, I know sort of leading, leading through change and challenging times is, is a key part of, of leadership, you know, across the board. What's your sort of sense of how leaders can improve in that area? Because everybody's had to, but not everybody has you know, has found a success as, as others. So any kind of key thoughts around how to how to meet that challenge? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think for me, leading through change and leading in uncertainty, and we've had both in the pandemic, I think kind of go hand in hand here. And I think you can't get away from some of the really simple stuff like really good communication, um, but it's communication with that human touch. And I think organisations that haven't got in touch with the, their sort of empathy side have found it harder. So I know in the pandemic, um, for example, rather than an occasional bulletin from me on decisions that the organisation had made that went to all staff, I started writing a weekly message to all staff or more frequent when there was a big change, you know, if we heard there was a lockdown or, or a big mm. decision like that. And it, it felt a really symbolic thing to do because it was a way of connecting us as an organisation because we'd gone from working in 11 offices to a thousand people's homes, you yeah. know, and it, we suddenly felt, hang on a minute, we can't see people, we could feel disconnected. So um, I did more personal communication and I found I was changing my style of communication. It wasn't just the sort of, these are, this is the news going on in the organisation. Mm there was more mention of things like you know this has been a difficult week or I found it really hard this week with you know news of a further mm. lockdown or whatever it might have been and it surprised me having started taking that more personal approach how it resonated with many of our staff because yeah. I think we, you know we were probably all feeling vulnerable in our own ways mm. at different times and knowing that you're not alone in that
that way um, was helpful to people. And we talked a lot about kind of support being available um, and also still talking about the really positive things. During the pandemic, we wrote a new strategy, which included um, kind of rewriting our whole purpose statement as an organisation. And at the one level, we were sort of firefighting the pandemic. And at the other level, we were writing about why we exist in our future plans but actually the two really go together because purpose I think is massively motivating um having that that strong sense of direction and knowing why you're with the organization and what the organization is trying to achieve really matters and somebody in one of my teams that does um training and work in employers premises had to we cut that service for a week or two when the pandemic started before we'd started the digital online training and I can remember that one of my colleagues saying the trouble is I'm at home and I haven't got very much to do and I just feel lost you know mm. I'm disoriented I haven't my kind of my reason for living is being taken away from me you know which might sound a bit melodramatic but actually it made me really acknowledge that work and achieving your outcomes at work is massively motivating mm. and important for people so I think organizations have to recognize that you know people aren't just um, cogs in an organizational process you kind of bring your enthusiasm your energy to work as well and recognizing that um, through some organizations I think works really well and then people bring not only you know, the ability to answer the phone or enter data or whatever their job might be. They bring their commitment, they bring ideas as well. Um, and they're in, you know, we're all we're all in need of those things, I think, as organizations. Absolutely. And it's a it's a time reminder that, you know, organizational culture is is about people's lived experience and, and what people do, not what's written down in the staff manual or whatever. And I, it's interesting, you know, to, by being more open and honest about how you were experiencing what was going on around you, it, it almost it emboldens everybody else to be the same, to share that. And that, and that kind of behavior will trickle yeah. down through the organization. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, you know, we, we still talk as an organization. It's good to talk. You know, that mantra is now part of our language. So, yeah. So that's a real positive to come out of the past. Yeah. And, and to maintain in the future as well. Mm. Um, as you said earlier, you know, a lot of your work is around getting to the point where issues don't arise or conflict doesn't arise, but people are people, I guess. And so there's a certain aspect of this that we, which might always be there. But this role of conflict, I think, you know, people hear the word and project a certain level of sort of understanding about all oh, conflict must be this. Or, But in terms of ACAS's work, you're obviously sort of delving into this in, in depth all the time and, and you're understanding what workplace conflict really is, is, is certainly a lot more in depth than a lot of other organisations. So what, in terms of your insights from that, is it inevitable? You know, I, I blithely say, oh, it's always going to happen, isn't it? Because people are people. But I, I don't know necessarily if that's true. And then in terms of leaders, what can they do to, to stop it happening or to at least mitigate it if they see signs of it? Yeah, so I'm with you. Conflict is inevitable in my okay. view. You know, it might not Feels happen. Feels like it is, no. but... Yeah. yeah, no, let's... I mean, let's hope it doesn't happen ever. Yeah. I think, you know, wherever you've got people, you know, there will be conflict from time to time for all sorts of really understandable reasons. And I think, you know, you it's unlikely that you're going to get fair, inclusive, effective, productive workplaces without some conflict. So I think the first thing to say about conflict is it's not synonymous with poor business practice. You know, conflict can happen in the best of organisations. And, you know, sometimes it arises because there's an imbalance of power, but often it's about just misunderstandings, you know, or lack of somebody's misinterpreted something and, you know, a small issue gets out of hand or somebody's feeling uncomfortable about a change. Um, so in my view, it's better to spend less time worrying about the causes of conflict and to think about, you know, kind of what to do about it. And I think we've seen that the pandemic at one level helped to kind of bring people together. <coughs> I think so you could argue there was less conflict for a period mm. of time during the pandemic because we were all a bit more focused on the keeping, you know, but our business is going. Um, but I think as the pandemic's worn on, conflict has been bubbling up. It's often around 
inequalities. And I think we've seen, you know, the pandemic exacerbated pre-existing inequalities with women, black, um, ethnic minority staff and so on feeling disadvantaged in the workplace or you get different groups, you know, those who are allowed um, to work from home, those who couldn't, you know, the whole you know, different set of dimensions, um, conflict now about some of the safety arrangements, vaccination, those kinds of things. Um, so I think it's almost inevitable um, that there will be conflict, but I think leaders have a really significant opportunity to reduce the levels of conflict and I think that's both by creating that culture of trust and transparency if you're transparent about decision making and about work arrangements people are less likely to feel that there's something mm. underhand going on or they're being disadvantaged but also when conflict does arise then it's about not hiding away from it and I think that's one of my my sort of strongest lessons that I've learned since I've been with ACAS, if there's conflict, deal with it and right. deal with it as early as possible. Otherwise, the likelihood is that it festers away. It'll raise its head at a later point and probably be harder at that stage. You know, when I look at some of the disputes we deal with, you know, you kind of think there was an opportunity at an early stage to get people around a table or to talk to an individual and try and resolve an issue. And it's just kind of gone on and on, not been tackled. And then it it gets harder. OK, yeah, that makes sense. I think there's probably a squeamishness about the, the process of bringing something to light. You know, maybe this is another cliche, but it's, it's kind of British thing to do is just to kind of push it to one side and then before you know it it's reached that kind of crisis point as opposed to just being open and engaging in a conversation which could potentially resolve issues much earlier on in the process I think I think that's really true actually I think conflict there is a bit of a taboo subject all, almost and I think as a as a manager as a leader you don't particularly like to acknowledge this conflict that can feel a bit uncomfortable um, you know a lot of people like to feel friends with you know their colleagues at work so again it feels a bit a bit tricky to deal with early on but you know I think often just kind of asking those open questions about you know you, you don't see yourself at work at the moment is this you know is there an issue we can talk about and just kind of trying to understand things that are really early level rather than that forming positions you know and then once you've you've taken a firm decision it's quite hard to um you know go to a more questioning approach which is usually more effective um, mm. and conflict I mean conflict can also be a good indicator of sort of systemic problems in organizations as well so I mean if you're regularly getting sort of grievances around pay issues you know kind of take a step back and think is that telling us something here that actually we've got a pay system that does have inequalities in it or is it telling us that you know there's a particular part of the business if you're getting more issues in one part of an organization than another is that around the leadership style is it around you know relationships in those areas is it about working practices so I think although as managers, as leaders, our prime aim is sort the conflict out, move on. There is something about that reflective piece as well, if you're getting conflict on a regular basis. And it's something we help organisations sometimes do that by doing that diagnostic to say, what's going on here? Is it about lack of clarity of policies and procedures? That could be an issue. Is it more about the climate that you've got in the organisation that maybe isn't inclusive or doesn't value colleague contributions? Or it might be a skill issue. And actually, we find this quite a lot in organisations. Line managers find themselves in that management position, often quite junior managers. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they're expected to resolve conflict, handle grievances, and they've never done that before. And I think those those early stages as, as a line manager are one yeah. of your most challenging times at work, actually. You've suddenly mm. moved from shop floor, you know, the team, as it were, and you're in charge. And so um, we don't help our managers if we don't train them mm. in some of these techniques. So I think that's a really significant thing. Being confident is, I think, one of the underlying enablers to resolving conflict. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I can look back on my own career, but, you know, having sort of been in different organisations and, you know, we promote people based on their sort of operational competence. Yeah. They're, the, they're the best in that team. So, well, the, ne the natural next step is some sort of seniority. And they don't 
get handed a manual on being a good manager on the first day it's just kind of like well hopefully you've absorbed you've absorbed some of this from watching and learning but it's all a bit kind of ad hoc and that sort of thing so i think bringing that structure to these kind of processes is, is a, a good way to sort of you know negate the things even arising if we just have a better culture of management a better way of bringing leaders through as opposed to just going ta-da see you on monday <laughs> you're a manager now so it's interesting to hear you, hear you say that as well um i realized we, we're kind of running up towards the end of the episode and i just wanted to sort of round things off by as i said at the beginning great that you're going to be involved in the the government people show uh coming up in a couple of months time because obviously what we're trying to do is share best practice and knowledge throughout the public sector so for you in terms of taking part are there any kind of key lessons from the pandemic or from you know, your own experience that you're you're sort of looking forward to sharing because you think these are key key points that maybe other public sector leaders can take on board and then flipping that on its head what anything you're interested in learning from your own public sector peers about their experiences and, and what they can share from their past two years and, and more oh that's a great question i'm always keen to learn but i think that the tips that probably i will look forward to sharing are around kind of how do you create that climate where you can be adaptable? I think that's an important one. The focus on soft skills, you know, emotional intelligence, training managers, like we've just been talking about, those soft skills really matter, I think, as well. And some of the processes around how you build trust, mm. how you really get a situation where you engage and you're able to get the best ideas from your staff. I think they're all really important to me. Um, and I think there's something around how do we take the best of those lessons that we learned in the pandemic to rebuild our organisations as we move out of the pandemic and for the longer term. So I think in terms of what I'm particularly looking for from other people, I'm really keen to find out about how organisations are adapting for the long term, uh, you know, how they're doing that planning, that visioning, how they're, uh, you know, working as leaders, as boards, executive teams to take their organisations forward. And I'm, I'm also really interested in the diversity and inclusion piece, because I think it's so massively important to all of our organizations nowadays and I think nobody really has the the full wisdom on this so I'm I'm very much wanting to learn about that too and how as a leader I can kind of live those values and commitments towards diversity and inclusion in a way that works for for my people too yeah absolutely and, and sort of going full circle as you said at the beginning that organizations are all different and so there's never a sort of one-size-fits-all approach to resolving issues that have layers of complexity have different people involved different views and so on so yeah it's it's good that we can we can come together and share those ideas and maybe take some of those elements to different organizations what what i think we've seen particularly in the public sector in the last couple of years is that is that spirit of collaboration has been renewed somewhat as you know whether it's kind of cultural sharing or whether it's sort of technical aspects you know data and all that all that sort of stuff there is this renewed sense of well we're all working towards the same big end goal which is you know a better experience for users better experience for our you know communities and so on so great to be able to bring people together to share that and, and sort of you know come up with more innovative solutions for the future so looking forward to that but um i've probably taken up enough of your time out of your busy day Susan. so all, all i'll do now is just say thanks so much for joining us for a really interesting conversation thank you tim i've enjoyed it thank you so there we have it thank you again to susan for joining me for that conversation Great to explore the future of leadership in the public sector and also how organisations are developing their culture in the post-pandemic world as we find our way through the hybrid and remote working culture. As I mentioned, Susan's joining us at the Government People Show coming up in March. The online conference is free to register, so I'm going to put a link in the show notes attached to this episode so you can sign up for free and join your public sector peers as we explore the future of work, the future of the civil service, the future of talent in the public sector. Loads of big issues to get into there, so don't miss that one out. I'll be back soon with another conversation with a public sector changemaker, but until then, goodbye. <laughs>